What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. As you all know, it's free and it's right there. And that enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible with as many people as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your guys' support. Now, today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by the Rock Nest Monster. Thank you for coming through, sir. You, 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 you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, it's I'm very excited about this. You got a lot, a lot of uh, amazing material that you put out over the years. And uh, mm -hmm. obviously, with Helter Skelter and as a solo artist, we'll get to a lot of that today. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that always uh, was striking to me about Nocturnal when I first got it was about was that first line, what's your dick doing in the moat? That always just threw me off right off the top. So how and why did that end up being the first thing on the album? I can't tell you. Sorry, can't tell you. It's just, yeah, that was, it was one of those things. It was, it was, we was in there, we was in the studio joking. And some of the joke got, some of the, some of the fuckery got caught on camera. I mean, on tape and it just happened. Okay. Yeah, that one always, because uh, I was like, man, this is not the album I was going to expect it. <laughs> but it definitely, definitely went off in a different direction. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, man, is this going to be a Jerky Boys album? So, oh, man. And I didn't want it to either. I was like, yo, what the fuck? Get that shit. It was like, nah, leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Fuck it. Leave it. Okay. Now, um, also, I thought it was interesting because Starang Wonder also is really the first one we hear on Nocturnal. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. creatively, how did that was him saying? That was him saying, "Fuck was your dick doing in the milk too?" That was his voice. It was it was all him. Yeah. So how how did he or not you or Ruck end up being the first one on your album? Cause that shit don't make that. Cause that shit is stupid. Like, cause, because it's an album, we package it the way we do. Somebody is giving us an announcement. Okay. If you have a, if you have a bit, when you have a big show, a big event going on, you have somebody announce it, right? Yes. Wouldn't it blow the fucking secret if I was announcing myself? <laughs> That's right. Okay. Fair it's enough. That simple. All right. Now, on understand too, I thought it was interesting how you're talking about how Helter Skelter means war. So, mm -hmm. uh, back when you were writing that and as you reflect on it, what does that mean and represent for you back then and now? Well, what that meant was like Charles Manson, you know, a lot of people associate Helter Skelter with Charles, with Charles Manson. What Helter Skelter really means is utter confusion, right? It, it's, you know, like if you, if you, when, if you ever, listen to like you hear people when whenever people use the term helter skelter outside of hip-hop what they're talking about is something that's all over the place something that's confusing it's confusion is shit is upside down you know what i mean ass backwards or whatever you know what i mean charles manson in his you know in his whatever on on the mission he was on or whatever he's he he was motivated by a fear of a war that was going to be between blacks and whites, right? It was a he's a, he's, a, he's like there's an there's an there's an inevitable war coming between darky and lighty, and darky is going to win. And when that, but but in the process of darky winning, darky will be so wounded that we, you know, my little coat, Charles Manson's little coat or whatever, we can then. Rock, come from from underground and overtake what's left of Darkie and put things the way they were supposed to be. That war is called Health the Skelter. Yes. This is what he this was this was in his words. You know what I mean? And so what we took from it was oh, the war between Darkie and Lighty and Darkie wins. All right, bet. We with that. You understand what I'm saying? So <laughs> That was what we took from it. But at the same time, we knew that, you know, a, a fucking uh, encyclopedia explanation of Helter Skelter just meant utter confusion. You know what I mean? And in that time, you know, I mean, it was like I, I always refer to those times or, or or any times of when you're young as a young male growing up in the streets, 
there's a period of life when it's cool to be crazy. You know, when crazy is cool or considered cool anyway by your peers and all of that. It's respected and all of that. I mean, you get older and you realize that little nigga, you're bugging. But, you know, when you're in the midst of it, that's the mind state. Uh, especially when when you look at the Beatles song, it's really about a park or a slide or, a, you know, going down a slide and stuff. It was crazy. What is, is that what the song is about, the Beatles song? Yeah. It's about a uh, a slide, you know, like a kid goes down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's it's very crazy. But speaking yeah. of... Speaking of crazy and examining mental stuff on uh, Nocturnal, I really liked the therapy song. And that was also a song that I thought since it, uh, for whatever reasons, that one didn't stand out as much to the people that talk about Nocturnal, at least in my circles. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, conceptually with you and Rock going back as a patient and a psychologist, psychiatrist, where did that mm-hmm. idea come from for you? That came from me as well. I mean, because the subject matter was was real. Like, I didn't just make that up. Like, you know, I mean, me and Ruck, we knew we were third out of the boot camp. You know, we was trying to, we, we, we wanted to take everything up a notch. You know what I mean? So as far as hardcore bars, I mean, that's that was easy for us. You know what I'm saying? And that was expected for us. But that was also an era when you when when you were it was thought that you had to be a little bit of you had to show some versatility on your album you know what i mean and you know back then dudes would have a a, your average album would have a you know it had a it would have mostly hard whatever it is that you do mostly but then it'll have a club record it'll have a record with a singer on it it'll have just to check just to check all of the boxes and if i was going to a song like I kind of combined, like I did my my record with a single on it and a, my deep record at the, you know, I combined them, you know, but they, but it was all real to me. You know, it was absolute as a young black male growing up in the hoods, you know, in that space and time when it's cool to be crazy. All you think about is violence. I thought I used to think about all kind of creative ways to do violence. You understand what I'm saying? Like it just it just was what it was. And. So I wrote about it one night. Me, me and Ruck wrote it in my mama's crib, in my bed, in my in my old room, and that was just that. I was like, follow my lead. I let him hear the first verse, and he and he and he just went from there. Okay. And where in the song you talk about, you know, your fear of coming up from the rear, basically your whole life and stuff. Where did that come from? Even as you were getting in the game and starting to have some success. I mean, that don't mean shit. I mean, the, that that wasn't speaking of that time. I was speaking of my life up to that point. You know what I mean? Or maybe to, or maybe up in or, or in, in or maybe like a little bit before that point. You know what I mean? Life started to change for me, but at the same time, you know, certain things oh, you know, like there's still even to this day as great as we are, we still boot camp as a whole takes a back seat to a lot of other dudes that came out in the era we came out in, you know what I'm saying? So it just is what it is. You know, those are dope. Them is life bars. They was life bars. Then they still, you know, they still play now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And also like too, at the end that Ruck was encouraging you and, you know, trying to, I guess, inspire you in a way. So, I mean, but that's what Ruck always was for me. Like he always like, you know, from the time that I met Ruck, like that was, I don't know, it's its kind of hard to, it's kind of, I don't, it's kind of hard to explain, but from the time I met Ruck, I felt at home. Well, I, I won't say from the time I met him, from the time we really connected, like, because I had trust issues. Once I knew that I could trust him, you know what I mean? Once I knew, because we was, we was street dudes and, and the, the gang we was a part of, like you, you couldn't trust even you, even though you was a part of this gang, you couldn't trust nobody in the gang. If they was, if they didn't come there with you, you know what I mean? But when I read, when I recognized and realized that I could trust Sean P. Everything changed. You know what I mean? Like, like everything changed. It was, I, I, I felt like, you know, because I, I don't know, I, it, it, I just felt understood. Like, it's a lot of, you know, I felt like I didn't fit in before him. 
even with like my, you know with, with whoever my circle was before him I felt like I didn't really fit in but it was like with him it was like we was two sides to the same coin we was completely different but it, it was like peanut butter and jelly it all made it sense he needed what I had not and I needed what he had and what was that what did you guys do that we just we balanced each other out you know I was serious. Oh, I was grumpy all the fucking time. He was, he wasn't at all. But at the same time, he was a wild card. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> Cause you even, yeah. uh, you even talk about uh, how you do have a, a bad mood a lot of the time in some of your uh, more recent stuff like Monster Ball. You talk about how you're in a good mood. Uh, one of your singles that came out 2012. I mean, but that I mean that came out in that did, well that well, song originally came out in 2010. Yeah, I was gonna say it resurfaced. I yeah. guess. A decade. Yeah, because these days these days I'm usually in a good mood. You know, I've you know um in real life like like rap changed my mood. You know what I'm saying? Like just living through going traveling, experiencing the things that hip hop has shown me. I'm not that same grumpy dude I used to be, you know what I mean? Like, like I was just unhappy was, was what it was. You know what I mean? Like I ain't have shit and ain't nobody understand what the fuck I was going through. And you know, that kind of, you know, that, that, that's a, you know, that's a, a, a rest haven for, 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 for grumpiness. And that's what I was, you know what I mean? But shit started to change. I got some shit. I started going some places. People was nice. You know what I mean? No shit. It's not so bad. Like, you know, everybody ain't out to take my little bit of whatever I got. You know, you start to realize the world ain't as ugly as you thought it was. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, some of the ice started to melt off of my shoulders. And what, how, when did that start happening, would you say? I mean, it actually started as soon as I started, like, you know, a couple, a, a year or two into the game. Like, I was already getting different. I was already becoming a way nicer person. Um, I don't know. I think then it um, am I am I the price? The process may have been slower than I'm letting on, but I know there was you know the process did begin as soon as I got in the game. You know, what I mean, when I first got in the game, I was still real standoffish and shit. But um, I know when it got to like the two thousands. Like 2001, two and three, I had a period of backsliding where I was on some bullshit. But I, you know what? It wasn't even so much that I wasn't backsliding in my um in my demeanor. I was still the same guy. You know, I was still my evolution had just continued. You know, my 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 evolution to a a, a you know a more calm spirit was still taking place, but my actions didn't show that because it was just I was just you know, life was in a place where it was necessary for me to do other shit that didn't, that kind of contradicted my new zenny, my new zen like, you know what I mean? Uh, persona or, 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 or state of being. It was like, you know, I'm spiritual, but I still punch you in the face. It was that type of thing. You know what I mean? So that was, you know, it was a lot of that going on. But as of like more recently, like like I feel like my calm is to a, it's to a point where it's even like I'm I'm on so much peace it's annoying to people who used to know me for violence you know what I mean who used to know me for the grouchiness and shit it's like like people call me mad about some shit and expecting me to be mad with them and help them rant and I'm telling them all kind of zenful shit all kind of listen man you got to they like man I want to hear that shit you know what I mean but but that's you know that's really a version that you get of me. But my but 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 my music is still hardcore because my principles are still the same. You know what I mean? It's still like I still don't condone stupid shit, and people do a lot of stupid shit. So that allows me to rap from a you know an aggressive perspective. You know what I mean? And you know satisfy my hardcore fans. You know what I mean? Yeah. But really, I'm I'm really I'm nice as fuck, man. I'm all smiles and weed and shit and fucking hugs and pounds and shit. You know and, what I mean? And with that, 
uh, as a writer, as a creative person, how, how do you think that's affected your output artistically? I mean, it hasn't. I mean, because I'm a writer. It's just more shit to write about. You know what I mean? It's, um, I love a challenge every now and again because I don't really care. Like I don't like I like I don't care how um I don't care what I'm doing or where I'm at in my life. I'm I I will take I will set aside some time to write some ignorant bars because people who shop at the Rockness Monster store, they were made fans of the Rockness Monster through ignorant bars. So I'm, it's like the Cheesecake Factory not selling cheesecake anymore. Like you can add things to the menu, B, but you got to still have some cheesecake there. Like, what the fuck is this? Be it's the cheesecake factory. You know what I mean? I so I I apply that 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 concept to you know my art. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles. The streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.